Welcome back to Free Kick, part of the Sports Social Network. You heard the familiar voice of Ian Crocker, Sky Sports Scottish football commentator, before the break. My next guest, though, is someone who knows what it's like to carry the hopes of a nation into a major international tournament and years on knows all about the despair and joy that comes with it. Craig Brown was Scotland's coach between 1993 and 2001 and led us to Euro 96 and the World Cup in France in 1998. As you'll hear, he was also part of the coaching teams of Alex Ferguson and Andy Roxburgh for the World Cups in 1986 and 1990 in Mexico and Italy respectively, plus Euro 92 in Sweden. He kindly gave his time to talk to me on Free Kick about his recollections of preparing for that game at Wembley in 1996 against Terry Venable's side, spoke about the current team and how they can recover in games to come. But he could completely understand how Steve Clark felt in the aftermath of the loss to the Czechs. Well, I've got every sympathy for him. I'm trying to remember how we got on in the opening game and various <laughs> tournaments. I was at five major tournaments for Scotland on the staff. I was on the staff at three of them, uh, starting with going to Mexico with Sir Alec Ferguson. He invited me as one of his coaches. And then I was at Italy. I was assistant manager with Andy Roxburgh. And then I was at the World Cup myself. And these are the three World Cups I've been at. And uh, in France was the third one, 98. But Scotland's only ever been at two European championships before this one. And uh, I was at both of them, 92 in Sweden. And... Uh, 96 in England. Uh, of course, I remember the England one most clearly because I was the manager at that time. Mm-hmm. So I've been through this same experience as Stevie Clark. I don't think we had it's quite as... It's a disappointing result. I wouldn't say the performance was reflected in the result. I think the least we should have got is a draw on the, on the performance and the chances. Uh, but they got two brilliant goals which made the difference and I will say what I think made the difference was uh, the, the striker uh, the, the, the striker who scored the two goals for the uh, for, for, uh, Czech Republic what a wonderful player mm-hmm. and uh, you know he's a he's a 26 million player so that kind of tells you that uh, <laughs> we haven't anyone I think of that value unless they promote Andy Robertson or Tierney who couldn't play into that category. But, you know, the one player made the slight difference. And therefore, I think it was a bit of a... uh, The result was a bit of a distortion. I don't think it was a fair result uh, at the end of the day. He'll be sitting tonight, he'll look back on the game and he'll he'll maybe do a bit of soul-searching. He'll try and find out where where the the team went wrong as well. And again, you can relate to that. How how long does that take before he, he, he comes up with a plan for the next game? Well, I'll have to get a plan quite quickly, I think, because th- this is annoying me in a, in a way. I'll be quite honest and say that England have every advantage here this next game. The main advantage is they'll get home, they'll get the home venue. That's one. But the next advantage, and I think it's a, a big one that nobody's mentioned, and I think it's quite important, they've got an extra day's rest. Mm. Now, a day makes quite a difference in a tournament. You know, if you get a, another day longer to recover and to rest up, for the Scotland boys, especially those who did a hard shift. You know, I'm looking at John McGinn there. He's running everywhere on that pitch for Scotland. Now, it'll take John a day or two to recover. And the longer he's got to recover before the next game, the better. Now, he's not the only one, but there was a fair shift uh, undertaken by the midfield, McTominay and McGinn in particular. So, England have a great advantage here. And I think Scotland will have to recover well. And I think with the best will in the world, it's not my business to say this, but I think he'll have to freshen his team up a wee bit uh, to change it slightly, even for the for the fact that the new boys will be fresh and raring to go, whereas the ones that played there, uh, when you play and you lose, you're more tired than when you play and you win. If they won the game 2 nothing, they'd have played tomorrow against England. But you've lost the game 2 nothing. It takes a day or two to come to terms with that. Take me back to 1996. You played Holland in the first game. It was a 0-0 draw, quite different circumstances. But you had England in the second game. What do you remember about the build-up to that game at Wembley against Terry Venable's side? Well, the big, the big memory I have, or the main memory I have, is the ticket scramble. <laughs> everybody, everybody in Scotland wanted a ticket. <laughs> and, uh, and the players wanted more tickets. And, 
you know, and they were, they're not asking for freebies, but they're wanting how many can we buy? Because everybody thinks a player gets unlimited tickets. In fact, they go further than that. They think they get unlimited free tickets, you know, <laughs> and they think the manager gets unlimited free tickets. So I, I, I found I had more friends than I thought I had <laughs> when, when we were playing. Honestly, the biggest problem wasn't he picking the team or the training or anything like that. It was satisfying the demands of uh, everyone, not just players, but officials who wanted tickets for that game now. And it was uh, there was Wembley holds a lot of people, uh, but it was a very great uh, issue. Now, what I did was I said to Colin Henry, I said, phone your pal at Blackburn, phone Shearer, Alan Shearer, find out how many tickets England players will get. <laughs> and when he told me, I did two. I think, I, I can't remember, I think he said they're getting four complimentaries and they're getting 10 to buy. So I said to the officials, Jim Farry, the chief executive of Scotland, uh, England are getting six tickets and 12 to buy. <laughs> I think, you know, I tried not to tell a lie. I said, I think England are getting... So I says, I don't want our team to feel inferior to them. So we've got to get the same number, <laughs> at least the same. And if we can give them more, They'll be, the players will be delighted and they'll pull out all the stops. Uh, they think, that, well, the SFA, the Football Association is looking after them very well. So I don't know, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's something like that. But anyway, the boys got what they wanted. And the other thing, of course, is car park passes, mm. tea room tickets. You have no idea, you know. And, and I said to the players, we'll get these tickets early in the week uh, after immediately we played, I think we played the Holland game. As soon as that's over, I want you to get rid of your tickets for the England game. I don't want you in that dressing room with somebody phoning you saying, where's my tickets? You know, and I don't want to hear tickets mentioned 24 hours before the game. Uh, get rid of that. Now, you're saying, what were the, what were the problems? <laughs> that was the first. The main problem was tickets. Then the next problem, of course, is trying to beat England. <laughs> And that was an easier problem than the tickets. <laughs> but, but what, what, uh, we problems, you know, the, the England pitch is different from most Wembley. Uh, I found, and, you know, I got the tip off, and I, I'm, I'm not sure, I think it was Alec Ferguson, got to remember to call him Sir Alec, said, look, get your boys a good session on that pitch because it's a sticky surface. If you run with the ball, you know, we've got the uh, Ryan Giggs runs with the ball and it sticks in the grass. The grass is not the way most of these top pitches are. Now, Hamden, I looked at it today, and Hamden is always a very smooth surface. Not The ball runs nicely, smoothly. Mm. The ball runs nicely at Wembley, but it sticks. And if you're dribbling with it, you're running with it, it you have to hit it a bit harder through the grass. So I got that bit of advice. I think it was Sir Alec that told me that. And he says, get, your, get a good training session on the, um, the Wembley pitch so that they know the pace of the surface. And we had this, well, this sort of motto uh, that you underweight your pass. When you're passing the ball to a receiving player, pass it as softly as possible. Now, there was a nonsense talk for years in Scotland, good firm passes, good firm. Now, if you give a good firm pass to a guy, before he can do anything with it, he's got to stop it and control it. But if you give it an underweighted pass, uh, he can play it first time. He doesn't have to control it. The ball's just coming to him nicely. Now, obviously, it's got to get there quickly enough to avoid being intercepted. But so we things like that we found important at Wembley because an underweighted pass at Wembley, if it's the same pass as you played at Hamden, it would stick. It wouldn't it would go half the distance. Uh, so. That was a problem in the in the training session before the before the game. So we went the day before. We were allowed to do a session at the same time as the kickoff the day before. It was an evening kickoff. You could train at night. If it's an afternoon one, you can train in the afternoon. So I can't remember, but we went and had a good session at Wembley, uh, which helped us when the game started. When you think back in your, your time as Scotland manager, particularly the, the games against uh, England at Wembley, and you managed in a couple of them. In, the, in terms of the build-up, would you say they were bigger than in maybe some of the other games you, you managed in through your time? Yeah, I think it all, it all, one word, Craig, uh, is yes. 
a game against England, you can't get anything bigger. You know, really, in the eyes, we played Brazil. Yeah. And they opened the game of the World Cup. Now they're the world champions. And uh, we've played Germany away. We've played France away. We played Germany away. They were the European champions. They won Euro 96. We've played them away. We played France away. We've played Russia away. I mean, we've had some real hard games away from home. But the most demanding and the most uh, critical, obviously, is <laughs> for pride alone, is England away. England at Wembley. That's the game that uh, that catches the imagination of every player and every supporter. So this game at the weekend that Stevie Clark got, this is a biggie. This is a big, big game because it will mean a lot to the fans, to the players, to the whole nation. Now, I believe you were at the game at Hamden against the Czech Republic. What was it? What was it like to be back in a, a football ground again with fans after the year and a bit we, we've had with this uh, pandemic? Yeah, well, it was fantastic, but uh, it was it was a wee bit surreal because uh, the announcer kept saying, "Please, everyone, ensure that you wear your safety mask." Your, uh, your uh, mask. Where's well, not your safety mask? <laughs> your, <laughs> <laughs> your mask, <laughs> not your, your safety, safety belt, but no, he was announcing wear the mask. So, mm. I mean, you're sitting in there, although you're at the game, you're told to wear the mask, so you have to wear it. And uh, there's no there's no such thing as a match programme. There's no hospitality. You can't get a, a, a cup of coffee at half time or a, a pie or anything like that. You can get water. Uh, so it's, it's a very unusual, and you're, you're, the seats are spaced. I mean, I went with a couple of friends and uh, I couldn't get sitting right beside them. You know, there are three seats between us. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want to make a comment about the game. You're talking to your pal. Well, the guy in front has got, how do you hear it? <laughs> <laughs> and he might be the father or the, uh, the brother of the player you're criticising, you know. Well, <laughs> I try never to criticise a player publicly anyway. But, you know... It's not, it, although there was, there was only 9,800 there, I heard. Although mm -hmm. they get 12,000 tickets, I don't know where the other 2,000 yeah. tickets went. Strange. But the, the official attendance that we heard over the Tannoy was 9,800 and something. And yet we were told that there was a 12,000 attendance. It looked quite busy and it was, I think, very pleasingly noisy. You know, the Tartan Army are great fans and they were shouting the odds, you know. Uh, to try and encourage the team so uh, you know it, it was great to get back to a game a real game and not have to watch it on television Now what struck me today was the fact that these players um, are, are under intense media glare intense public glare because this is the first time it's happened in 23 years you, you said earlier you, you were part of five um, parties that went to major tournaments two of which you were the manager of was the fact that you were part of those parties before being manager yourself a help in experience and the, the full publicity? Yeah, Craig, that's a great point. A massive help to have been there when you weren't the manager. You know, I mean, imagine getting invited by Alec Ferguson to go to Mexico as one of his coaches. And just to be able to sit and listen to him, the, I would say the best manager on the planet ever, and to see how he handled the players, how he handled a team meeting, how he handled the training, and, and how he handled the team in a match day. I mean, that was an education. You couldn't, you couldn't buy that, you know. And, and incidentally, I never once heard the hairdryer stuff, <laughs> you know. And I, I've said to his co colleague, my pal, uh, Archie Knox, Archie, what about this hairdryer? He says, I think once, I was with him at Manchester United and at Aberdeen, and once he had a blast at David Beckham. He kicked a boot and he, he gave him the head the bases. Once in twelve years or something like that, you know. And of course, it became it became famous for the hairdryer. Now I was with uh, Alec uh, had ten games manager of Scotland, and uh, you know when I was with him, I never once heard him raise his voice. He never shouted at any of the onto the pitch or at half time or then never he, he spoke plenty. And when he spoke, then he loved to have, in the good weather we had in Mexico, he loved to have a team meeting outside. You know, you weren't in a classroom environment. The players don't like that. You know, and when 
you go to a hotel and you ask for a meeting room, and you say you want 24 seats, so you've got the players and the staff in, you always get them in rows. And I always said to the kit man, change these seats, make them ragged, uh, random. Don't put them in rows because I don't want the guys to come in thinking they're at school, getting a lecture. I want them to think, you know, in, in, in casual, informal, mm. and move the chairs about, which he did. And, and never, when they came in, it was a it was a chat. It wasn't a lecture. And a team meeting was a was a chat. And, and I learned that just watching the master. I like, he, he chatted to them. He would say, well, we're getting a free kick outside the box. Any of you get any ideas what you've done at your club and might be a good shout? You know, he wouldn't say, you'll do this and you'll do that and you better. It, it was totally different from what I would have imagined before I joined. But, so you asked me about, I had that experience. And, and, and Andy Roxo was a very, very uh, good manager of Scotland. And, I, you know, they're talking about just now getting to the last 16, you know, if they get out of this last 24 we're in. Yeah. Now, they've got another round to go before they get where Andy got. Andy hit Scotland in the last eight <laughs> in, uh, in Sweden because yeah. only eight teams qualified. So we were in the, the last eight. We went right into the quarterfinals. And now we're thinking it's going to be great to get into the quarter. Of course it will be. But it'll not. They, they're mistaken journalists saying that will be the first time we've ever done this and that. No. Andy had the team uh, in the last eight. When I had the job in Euro 96, 16 teams qualified. So we were in the last 16 then. <laughs> now we have to get out of this group to get into the last 16. And I'm, I'm sure and I'm confident with, with, with the four best thirds, I'm sure we'll. Uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic we will get out of the group because uh, we'll get something at Wembley and then we'll beat Croatia. I was just going to ask you, we've seen this movie before where we've lost the first game, we're feeling a bit low, a bit negative about our chances, but, you know, anything can happen. Of course, you know, we've lost the first game. It's given a great boost to the Czech Republic to get in a way, well, it's really, it's supposed to be a neutral venue hmm. for this tournament, but uh, we had a home go and we lost a home game to them and they'll be delighted. They've got the, the three points. And, you know, the other thing they've got, and it's a wee bit worrying, is an extra goal. They've got two goals. If it goes to goal difference, you know, I was panicking there. There was a, a point in the second half when I thought they're going to get a third goal. And if they get a third goal, you know, goal difference would be hard to make up. But uh, if we beat England 9-3 the way they did this, that'll make up the goal <laughs> difference. <laughs> So how do you see the game on Friday going then? You know, the, the guys will want to react to, obviously. Well, I watched the England game. I watched them the other night. And uh, I thought they, against Croatia, I thought they were okay. But they weren't invincible. They didn't worry me, I'll be honest. You know, I looked at them and, you know, uh, you know the, the names worry you maybe more than the performances. You know, well, we know that Kane will score a goal, given Harry Kane will score, given a chance. And then the wee boy that scored the other night, uh, Raheem Sterling, he'll score a goal. But I've got some young, talented boys, you know. Uh, and even Grealish, didn't they come off the, uh, the bench? Foden looks terrific, you know. Uh, and, and I think we've got a very difficult game against England because they're in good form. They're highly experienced guys. And I think they've got a very good football manager. I think that uh, Gareth Southgate uh, has done very well as a manager of England. Uh, and I really think, you know, if we can get if we can get a draw there, it would be a good result. And then I'm sure, I couldn't be more sure we'll beat Croatia at home because Croatia are, are in a down spiral now. They were one of the top countries in the world until recently, but the last three, four years, there's nothing. There've been nothing like the old Croatia, and in fact, you know they say I don't know. Read the papers. There's dissension in the camp. There's a lot of bad feeling. You know, there's, they're, they're fighting amongst each other, disagreeing about things. So, if that's the case, that's good for us. 
before we go, Craig, you were good enough to, to take the time to talk to me. I said this to you before we started recording. You've had many requests to speak about your time as a Scotland manager um, in the build-up to this. Have you enjoyed taking the trip down memory lane and looking back on, on some of those memorable moments? Yeah, I've got to say I have, and I have enjoyed it. To, you know, I think, though, there's always a... It resurrects criticism as well. You know, I think we did quite well. You know, I had 70 games with the Scottish team and, and 50 of them we weren't beaten. You know, I got a few draws right enough. <laughs> but, but, you know, you're, you're, I'm quite proud of the fact that 50 times I had that team, we didn't lose. Now, that sounds negative, but it's a, it's a pleasing statistic to me that, you know, the Tartan Army have been brilliant with me and, you know, they're still in touch with me a lot of the officials of the various groups of the Tartan Army. And anywhere I go, eh, people say, oh, that was great when you were at, with Scotland. Oh, yeah, I feel a wee bit disappointed that we didn't eh, progress a wee bit better in, in each tournament. And, and that, to be honest, is a, a major regret. And I think the, the, the biggest regret was Euro 96, where it was, it was a goal scored that put us out wasn't even goal difference, it was goal scored. And it was that goal that went through uh, Siemens' leg, uh, Clivert's goal, uh, that went through the goalkeeper's legs. And that effectively finished us. And, and we maybe, if had we thought, we had to, we might have managed another goal against uh, Switzerland in that, in that final game. But, you know, that's a big regret. I think we could have done better in uh, Euro 96. The World Cup, in France, we get slated for losing the last game. But the very interesting thing is this, we lost 3 nothing to the Morocco, and they say, oh, that was a disgrace. Now, Morocco were the African champions, and that's hard to win that championship. And they've got 36 million people, and they're football mad in, in Casablanca in Morocco. Uh, so the, the ignorance of the press, thinking this is an easy game, you know, uh, Nonsense, of course, but and in the game, the statistics, FIFA gave a technical report after the tournament uh, of the World Cup, and we got it. Now, every statistic was favoured Scotland, except the goals. You say, well, it's the goals that count, and I, I'm right, it is the goals that count, but Scotland had more of everything. They had more possession in both halves. They had more shots at goal. They had more corner kicks. They had more of everything. And even with 10 men, when Burley gets sent off, and he was sent off uh, in 53 minutes. So we'll get 37 minutes plus stoppage time, or 40 minutes to play without him. And even playing with 10 men, we get more of everything than Morocco. But Morocco scored three goals. And I, I that's the only time I was really kind of really disappointed and kind of angry in a way with the press because they were using words like humiliation, you know. And Drummy, I said, were you at the game? Did you see the game? You know, we played we played better than they did. And we had 10 men for most of the second half. But that's a big regret. That was, you know, we had to, we had a chance against Morocco to progress. But uh, uh, they managed to, to score three goals. In, uh, and I think, you know, a couple of the goals were quite soft. And we had... Equal chances, more chances, more of everything. Anyway, that's that's me moaning, making excuses. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it, it was a privilege, Craig, to be uh, in charge of the team and the, the, the experiences I had were wonderful, uh, both on and off the pitch. And uh, I'll always be grateful for that. 